Okay, today I have with me Scott Ritter. He's a former UN weapons inspector and Marine and one of the most sought after individuals for better understanding the Russia-Ukraine war, um, what Ukraine is up against, uh, what Russia is doing. He understands uh, Russia and Russia thinking uh, better than most people. So Scott, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. Um, we just picked the perfect time. The uh, garbage man just came out and got my garbage can, so my dogs are barking, so I hope uh, you don't mind that for No, I, I don't <laughs> even hear it. Um, okay. Well, again, thank you. Um, and at the end of this, we'll tell people about where they can get more information uh, about you and also your book uh, that has come out. But uh, something that I've noticed in my YouTube comments section is a lot of chatter around, I believe it's pronounced Bakhmut, and uh, of course, you know, Ukraine was hit with a, a barrage of, of missiles uh, just in the last 24 hours. But maybe you could help my listeners understand um, from a Ukrainian perspective and also from a Russian perspective, why, why are people so hyper-focused on this Bakhmut battle? And why is it so crucial for the next part of this military operation? Certainly, um, thanks for the question. Look, what, what what's taking place in Ukraine right now, I'm not gonna go through the history of how we got there. I'm just gonna say, this is what's happening. It is positional warfare. Uh, the Russians and the Ukrainians have a line of contact that is well-defined and has been heavily fortified by both sides. Um, Bakhmut, uh, what was called the Bakhmut Solidar Complex um, is the Gordian knot of this uh, of this defense line. It's the, that which holds it together. It's uh, you know heavily defended, heavily fortified, important command and control, important important logistics. Um, and if it if it falls, basically the entire Ukrainian defense will be unraveled. But it's more than that. The Ukrainian government has decided that. Um, it's not going to, for instance, withdraw from Bakhmut and build a new defensive line behind it. Actually, some people think that's a better idea. If you look at the map, the territory behind Bakhmut is higher ground. So it's eminently more defensible uh, than sacrificing everything in, a, in city fighting. But the Ukrainians made a decision to hold on to this, and they have thrown tens of thousands of troops into this battle. Uh, it's become the decisive battle of the war. Uh, the number of dead from this battle alone, some people estimate, uh, could be you know as as, as high as seventy thousand, um, and that's that's over a period of time. But still, that's a that's a heavy number. Uh, the Russians have likewise thrown thousands of men into this fight and suffered thousands of casualties. Not on the level of the Ukrainians, but still, it's a it's a very dangerous fight. Um, and. The president, you know, you've seen a lot of people try to distance themselves from the inevitability of the fall of Bakhmut. Um, you hear Lloyd Austin, the uh, Secretary of Defense, say it's it's just a place on the map. It is of no strategic value. You've heard General Zeluzhny and other Ukrainian generals saying, "No, I mean we we've we we it's a battle, but we've got other things going on, you know, etc." Zelensky is probably the only honest one. He said, "If Bakhmut falls, it opens up the entire Donbas region uh, for Russian." Uh, occupation. Uh, because here's the deal. There's a finite number of troops. If you spread them out along the entire uh, line of contact, same thing with the Russians. And then what's happened with Bakhmut is it's a magnet. So any extra forces you have from the Ukrainians get thrown into Bakhmut, any reserves thrown into Bakhmut. Same thing with the Russians. The Ukrainians have run out of troops to put into Bakhmut. They, they don't have anybody left. They're going to, you know, any reserves they scramble will be sent to Bakhmut. Russia is still sitting on anywhere from 120 to 200,000 uh, reserves that ha are still being trained, organized, and they're being prepared to be introduced to the battlefield. So if, if you have this defensive line and suddenly Bakhmut falls and the front balloons up, you've increased the amount of frontage dramatically. You've gone from you know here and then it balloons up to here. Russia has troops that can fill this gap, man the lines. Ukraine doesn't. So as it balloons up, Ukraine's going to have to take troops from elsewhere, thin out areas, and try to contain the Russians. But the Russians aren't going to expand in a way that's 
cannot be contained. And as the Ukrainians withdraw troops from other parts of the battlefield, the Russians will be able to exploit that and push through. So this will be the complete unraveling of the Ukrainian defenses. This is what uh, President Zelensky fears, and this is what I, I actually agree with him on this point, that there's a real risk that if Bakhmut falls, Bakhmut falls, it will be the unraveling of the Ukrainian defense and the beginning of the end of the Ukrainian army. Um, and this is on top of what General Jan Stoltenberg, the Secretary General, said last month, where he said, you know, I mean, this is an artillery-driven war. I think people need to under that, understand that, too. Um, you know, this is a war that's about, you know, the amount of artillery and the, the intensity of fire, which means artillery ammunition. How many rounds you can fire per tube per day at the enemy dictates the casualties that you produce. Uh, this is why the Ukrainians have suffered very heavy casualties. The Ukrainians respond with fewer tubes, but they're quality tubes, Western tubes, 155 millimeter ammunition, and they have better intelligence provided by the United States so they can target it more effectively. And so they're able with less to still blunt and compete with the Russians. But they're firing ammunition at a rate that can't be sustained logistically. Uh, and the West has depleted its stocks of 155 millimeter ammunition, and they can't produce it quick enough to meet the expenditure rates of the Ukrainians. And so sometime this summer, Ukraine will run out of ammunition. And if you're in an artillery-driven war where one side has a tremendous amount of artillery tubes and a lot of artillery ammunition, you have lesser and you run out of ammunition, you're going to lose that war. So this is going to be a double blow. The, the, the unraveling of defenses right about the same time that Ukraine runs out of ammunition. And so the, the potential of Russia to roll up the Ukrainian military increases exponentially. Now, you mentioned the uh, air attack. There's a third aspect to this fight. Um, when the Russians reorganized back uh, at the end of last year, uh, they, 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 they took a singular commander at, at that time was a general named Cyril Vakin, um, a sort of bald-headed guy they nicknamed Armageddon. Uh, he ran the okay. military operation. Uh, but then they, they, they brought in uh, General Gerasimov from the general staff to head it. And then there was a ground component commander and an air component commander. And uh, so Viking was the air component commander. This means that the war is going to get far more complicated. There's, there's bigger frontage, more troops, uh, the need for greater staff capacity. And with a dedicated air commander, it means that the air battle is going to become a separate front. And it's escaped the attention of many people who have been focusing on the, the more bloody, therefore dramatic uh, fighting of Bakhmut. But what's been happening in the airspace over Ukraine is a very uh, important battle between Ukrainian air defense and Russian long-range strike capacity, the caliber missiles, air-launched and sea-launched, various air-launched cruise missiles, the Iskander surface-to-surface um, uh, -surface missile, and a missile called the Kinzhal, which is the dagger or the hypersonic missile that's fired in. Um, the, you know, the Russians achieved initially, uh, when they started the strategic air campaign, they suppressed Ukraine's infrastructure, especially the power generation infrastructure. And as a result, Ukraine sought enhanced air defense support from NATO, and they've been provided it. The Germans provided the IRIS-T, the Norwegian the United States provided the NASAMs, then we provided the Patriot, other people have provided the Hawk. Um, and the Ukrainians have been trying to build an air defense system capable of withstanding not only the Russian missiles, but new drones, long-range drones, suicide drones, the Iranian drones, the Shahid-136s, the Geranium-2, which is the Russian-made variant of that. And so they've been playing this game where the Russians test the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians uh, send up their air defense, the Russians identify the air defense, suppress the air defense, and they play this little cat and mouse game. And last night, the Russians sent a marker down that said, we won. We've now figured out your air defense. And boom, 81 missiles. Most of them hit their targets. And six of these were Kinzals, the hypersonics. Up until then, the Kinzal has been a one-of system. You fire one, you fire another one, because they're very expensive. What the Russians have been doing since um, mid of last year is they've basically tripled the production capacity for Kinzals, and those, pr those production missiles are starting to reach the front line. Six were fired last night. That's six targets that were guaranteed to be destroyed. There's nothing the Ukrainians can do to stop it. But as the Russians incorporate more and more of these, um, you're going to see the total unraveling of Ukrainian air defense, which means that the Russians are going to collapse Ukrainian society. And with the collapse of society, the, the, the collapse of the economy will come 
the political collapse of Zelensky. And this is going to happen in parallel with the destruction of the Ukrainian military. And this is why I personally believe this war is probably going to be wrapped up some time by late summer, early fall. Because the Russians, there's nothing the Ukrainians have that can stand up to what the Russians are getting ready to do. Yeah, so, um, you know, you've covered some of this, but um, I mean, how does how does this fundamentally shift if all of a sudden all the combined NATO nations can't provide enough artillery rounds to keep up with Russia's 24-7 production? Uh, they, they break through Bakhmut and then do they just head up to Kiev? Or are they, you know, what what's the next move? Because if they figured out the air defense system and how to take that out, uh, does that become their their next focus, or do they just basically bleed them dry on ammunition? You know, one of the mistakes that Russia made early on in the conflict was um, going in with uh, force structure insufficient to the task. They they thought they were going to bum rush the Ukrainians. They thought by coming in with 200,000 troops, that they could compel the Ukrainians to a negotiating table and get a rapid negotiation into this conflict. And it almost worked. If you remember the three uh, rounds of discussion in Gomel, Belarus, and then the fourth and final one in Istanbul, this was the Russian plan. Um, and it would have worked. Ukraine would have signed an agreement that would have brought an end to the conflict, uh, keeping Crimea permanently Russia. Donbass would be independent, but all other territories would be returned to Ukraine, Zelensky would still govern, the army would still be there, but no NATO presence. That was the agreement. Imagine if they had that agreement today, how many hundreds of thousands of people would be alive. But NATO intervened and said no, nixed it. And so now we're, we're at where we're at. Vladimir Putin on February 21st gave a speech to the uh, Federal Assembly, uh, the Russian Federal Assembly, in which he said exactly what's going to happen. A lot of people listened to it and said, well, why isn't Putin tell us about the big invasion? I said, he, he did. He just didn't listen to what he said. Putin said, number one priority is to restore the economic and social uh, life, quality of life of Russians. That means Kherson, Zaporizhia, Donetsk, Lugansk. That the Russian military's job is to restore Russian control over the totality of Russia, which means they're going to push Ukrainians out of all the territory that's encompassed there. And then he said, and this is the part that many people missed, that the Russians will continue to push the Ukrainians back to the range of the longest range system provided by NATO, which right now is 150 kilometers because of the HIMARS with the small bomb unit. Um, and now if you look at 150 kilometers from Russia, uh, that includes the city of Odessa, that includes Nipotrovsk, Kharkov. So Putin has said, we're taking all of these cities. And then the question is, what kind of negotiated settlement do you want? Do you want one where we return these to you or do you want one where we keep these? Um, and they're not going to be negotiating with Zelensky. Zelensky is over. This is why you have the air campaign. Russia envisions the political collapse of Ukraine. Russia doesn't need to take Kiev. Russia doesn't want to take Kiev because Russia learned with 200,000 troops, you, you bit off more than they could chew. That's why the Ukrainians were successful in their counteroffensive in September, because Russia didn't have enough troops to man the line. Russia now has between 600, 700,000 troops, but that's sufficient to do that which Putin just said, take over the Donbass, recapture territories, push them back. But any concept that Russia is going to go up and occupy Western Ukraine or come down and take Kiev, not with these resources, and Russia is not planning on any mobilization. So Russia is looking for a combined military political solution. The military solution is the destruction of the Ukrainian army, which we see taking place in Bakhmut right now. The political solution is the collapse of the Zelensky government and replacing it with a Ukrainian government that will unconditionally surrender to Russia and then be subjected to allow, I mean, basically you'll get a military occupation and a denazification process that's gonna take anywhere from two, three, five years. Um, but that's the future of Ukraine, unfortunately. It's not one that they deserve, uh, but it's the one they're going to get. And they're going to get it because NATO is powerless to stop this. It's not just that NATO doesn't have any artillery ammunition. Uh, General Cavoli, the head of the uh, Supreme you know, Supreme Allied Commander, the head of American forces, um, spoke in Sweden in, uh, in January. And he said the violence, the scope and scale of the violence taking place in Ukraine is beyond the imagination of NATO. That means that NATO isn't trained, equipped, organized, led, sustained, 
to wage that kind of war. So there's nothing NATO can do short of nuclear conflict to stop the Russians from accomplishing what I just laid out. Um, NATO doesn't have an army capable of power projection. You know, everybody said, well, 100,000 American troops. Yeah, that's it. Uh, where, where, how are they going to survive? Where's their artillery ammunition going to come from? They've given it all to the Ukrainians. The British run out of artillery ammunition two to four days into a conflict. The rest of NATO does the same. The Germans can't get troops out of the barracks. The French can't get troops out of the barracks. There is no NATO army. There is no NATO capability to wage this kind of war. It will take years to create that kind of capability. Meanwhile, Russia wins the war. So I think, you know, when, you know, what I la laid out for Russia is a realistic projection of what could happen. Nothing is 100% certain. No plan survives initial contact with the enemy, and the enemy always gets a vote. And I'll say this about the Ukrainians. Uh, they've shown themselves to be extraordinarily courageous, tenacious, and capable fighters. And so um, anybody who automatically writes them off is a fool. Uh, whatever Russia victory emerges, it will be it'll only be won through extraordinarily high, um, uh, high intensity combat that will be costly to all parties involved. But I think that military math is on the side of Russia. It's against Ukraine and the Ukrainian equation cannot be balanced by NATO, which has nothing left. Yeah, I mean, yeah. from a from a personal standpoint, uh, I, I want peace. I, I've wanted peace. When Boris Johnson went in and said, don't do this, NATO will back you, I, I believe that that was the wrong move. But unfortunately, Ukraine is going to run out of bodies and, and weapons. Um, and then Zelensky says things like, uh, you know, American, American boys and girls will fight and die in this war if America doesn't support us. I don't, I don't agree with that. But um, my main thing with like my YouTube channel is I'm not pro Putin and I'm not anti Ukraine. I'm, I'm pro peace, but I want the truth because the mainstream media has been misleading people that uh, Ukraine is this like incredible army, which they are. Their bravery is second to none. Their, their battle up against what they've been up against is incredible. Uh, but like you say, mathematically, uh, NATO isn't going to be able to supply bodies and they're not going to be able to su supply weapons enough. Um, so I, I appreciate you pointing that out. Um, do you, I, I hate to like play the blame game, but you know, NATO. Okay. So let me put it this way. Uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor told me, you know, that they, they had this peace deal organized and now, uh, Putin, He's not, he's not trusting anybody. He's not going to come to the table with the same deal that they have. You just said kind of the same thing. So at, at what point do you think that they will come to the table? And you said you don't believe Zelensky will be involved? Zelensky had his chance. He has actually had several chances. Um, you know, the Russians, I always tell people or remind people to uh, just ask the following question. Um, why is Zelensky still alive? Why is Zelensky allowed to communicate? Why is he allowed to go and, and raise money and do all this? Because the Russians let him. Why do the Russians let him do this? Because Russia is not seeking or was not seeking the destruction of Ukraine. Russia was seeking the surrender of Zelensky. So they need him alive. They need him to communicate with his NATO allies uh, to create a, uh, you know, a, a negotiating position that uh, could lead to the end of the conflict. He's opted instead to misinterpret Russia's decision to keep him alive as evidence of his um, invincibility. Um, he's not invincible. His days are now numbered. Look, there will be, in my opinion, a um, negotiated settlement to this war. But it's not going to be um, two parties sitting down. Um, negotiating. It's not even going to be Lee at Appomattox, where you know, um, I mean, that's one possibility if Zelensky is replaced by, for instance, General Zeluzhny, and um, you have a Lee at Appomattox moment where Lee and Grant get together and shake hands and sort. I'm envisioning more of um, the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay, where the Russians victoriously lined up and bring in a defeated Japanese military who unconditionally surrenders uh, to them. Um, that's, that's where Russia is. Why? Why is Russia doing that, especially when they were willing less than a year ago, to sit down in Istanbul 
and terminate this conflict in a way that was not advantageous to Russia at all. Actually, in many ways, it was disadvantageous. Um, why would Russia, what, what changed that? Well, first thing we have to understand is that this war was brought on by NATO expansion, playing up. Uh, in February of um, 2008, uh, William Burns, who is currently the director of the CIA, back then he was the U.S. ambassador to Russia, wrote a memorandum called Net Means Net, Russia's Red Lines on Ukraine. And he warned the United States and everybody, all NATO partners, that Russia's red lines were serious, that if NATO were to invite Ukraine in, this would inevitably trigger a chain of events that would probably lead to Russia's military intervention in Ukraine, the loss of Crimea, the loss of the Donbass. This was known in 2008, and yet we invited Ukraine in, which means from a cause and effect analysis, we knew what we were getting into. We were warned by the U.S. ambassador to Russia that if you invite NATO, there will be a war, Russia will intervene, and Ukraine will be dismembered. And yet we did it anyways. Then we entered into this policy of uh, the Great Reset under Obama, which was really just regime change to replace Putin with Medvedev. That didn't work. Putin stayed in. So then we sought to undermine Putin by promoting the the, the Maidan coup that got rid of the pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, replaced him with a government of our choosing that happened to be composed of radical right-wing nationalists who have links with Nazi Germany's ideology. And we've empowered them, the Azov Battalion. Don't believe me. Believe the U.S. Congress, since from 2015 onwards, had an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act, which said no money can be used to support the Azov Battalion because it is a white supremacist neo-Nazi unit. If the U.S. Congress is recognized as such, I agree with them on this one. But we've empowered them. But even then, Russia sought to avoid war. You know, in 2014, there was a battle north of uh, Donetsk in the Donbass where uh, anti-Ukrainian forces, ethnic Russians, supported by the Russian government, we know that, they deny it, but we know it, um, surrounded 10 to 15,000 Ukrainian soldiers and were going to annihilate the Ukrainian army. That would have ended the fighting. Uh, the Ukrainian government went to the French and the Germans and begged their intervention, and they came in and they negotiated something called the Minsk Accords. And the Minsk Accords were basically a ceasefire uh, that would uh, then turn into a permanent ceasefire uh, that would respect the um, the autonomy of ethnic Russians so they could speak their language, study their, you know, have their religion, et cetera, but keep the Donbass as part of Ukraine. Um, Russia believed in this, signed it. Putin tried to implement this for eight years. We now know, and what we've learned since Boris Johnson's intervention, Petro Poroshenko, the president of Ukraine, has come out and acknowledged it was a sham. We never, we were never going to do Minsk. We only entered it to buy time so NATO could build a Ukrainian army that could conquer the Donbass through force of arms. So it's a NATO builds an army that is going to, through force of arms, solve the situation that Minsk, remember, Minsk isn't just an agreement between uh, Ukraine, Germany, and France. It was taken to the Security Council of the United Nations, and there is a United Nations Security Council resolution saying this is international law, this is the will of the world. So Russia's believing this. But Ukraine saying, no, that's all a lie. We're going to build an army and resolve this thing, which the Security Council says must be resolved peacefully. We're going to resolve it through force of arms. And now we found out from Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande, the German chancellor and the French president, that they said the same thing. It was a sham. And we're never going to implement events. It was always designed to build the army. And then the United States built the military training facility in western Ukraine in 2015, where every 55 days we trained a Ukrainian battalion to NATO standards to send them off to fight against the Russians in the Donbass. So now you're Vladimir Putin, and you're looking at this, you're saying they used diplomacy as a shield to build a military to violate the peace agreement that the Security Council of the United Nations said is manifest. Why would I ever negotiate with them again? And that's a question that every American, everybody listen to this, if you're in his shoes, why would you negotiate with anybody again. He had to go to the wives of the military men serving, some of them whose husbands had died in the war, and apologize. And he said, the greatest mistake I ever made was believing the West when they said they wanted peace. I, saw, I had the Ukrainian army where I wanted them. I could have destroyed them. I could have ended this thing right then and there on terms favorable to us. But they said they wanted peace. They said they believed in peace. And I believed them. And for eight years, sat back while the Ukrainians shelled. Remember, Petro Poroshenko, the same man who said it was a sham, he got on the air and broadcast 
that Ukrainian children will be able to go to kindergarten and walk in the parks and live a normal life. But the children of the Donbass will be cowering in their basements because of Ukrainian artillery fire. And he lived up to that promise for eight years, killing hundreds of these children, thousands of civilians, and also, meanwhile, fighting that led to thousands of deaths on both sides in terms of combatants. It was a very bloody conflict uh, perpetrated by the Ukrainians because they didn't want peace. So now Putin is sitting there saying, I learned my lesson. I will never make this mistake again. This war will end, but not by me falling yet again to the lies of the collective West, but by me dictating Russia's terms. And Russia's terms aren't unreasonable. Russia's terms are simply put, no more Nazis. And if anybody doesn't believe that what's going on in Ukraine is a resurrection of the, the neo-Nazi ideology of uh of Adolf Hitler, just study Stepan Bandera, study the role the CIA played in promoting Bandera, encouraging Bandera, talk about the war that took place, CIA secret war, using Bandera's forces from 1945 to 1953 in Ukraine. They killed a quarter of a million Russians, 50,000 Russian security forces, 150,000 Ukrainian insurgents. No American knows about this war. Talk about the 150,000 Ukrainian Banderas who fled to a diaspora, including here in the United States, 60 miles away from where I live. There's a, Bandera, a, a monument to Stepan Bandera called Heroes Park, where his statue is there with four other Nazis. And every summer, Ukrainian Banderas, Americans, gather there and hold torchlight parades where children carry the imagery of Bandera and parade around singing praises to the slaughter of Jews, Poles, and Russians. That's what the government of Ukraine is today. So the Russians are saying denazification. That means they're going to get rid of Zelensky and replace that with a government will never again tolerate or glorify Stepan Bandera or his ideology. It also means the destruction of the Ukrainian army, which is happening as we speak through the Battle of Bakhmut. Um, this, these are the objectives, and Ukraine will never be allowed to join NATO, ever. Now, what will be left of Ukraine? We know that they've permanently lost 20% of their territory. We know if this war continues, they'll probably lose 30% more because the Russians aren't, if the Russians capture Odessa, uh, the Epipetrovsk and Kharkov, they're never going to give it back. Those are Russian cities. They're never going to return them. The only way to avoid the loss of those territories is for Ukraine right now to surrender on Russia's terms. Uh, but that's not happening because NATO won't let them. So this war we fought to its inevitable conclusion, its tragic conclusion, and it means the death of the Ukrainian nation as we now know it. And that means tens of millions of Ukrainian civilians will be suffering for decades. And this is tragic. My heart breaks. But we're the ones responsible. We, the United States, we created this conflict. We are the ones that breathed life into the Minsk agreement, knowing it wouldn't ever be implemented. Remember, Putin met with Biden in Geneva in June of 2021. And part of that conversation, Putin said, please do everything you can to make Minsk happen. If you sign the Minsk Accords, if they sign it, they implement it, then there will be no problems. This whole thing goes away. And Biden promised him, send Tony Blinken to do this. And Blinken said, I'll do it. But he lied because we had no intention of implementing Minsk because we knew that Minsk was a sham designed to buy time to get lethal aid to the Ukrainians that we trained so they could attack the Donbass. We have not been honest brokers here, and we aren't honest brokers today. And frankly speaking, I don't want to get political here because this is a larger issue than, than politics, but the Biden administration can never be trusted by the Russians ever again. Ask yourself why there is no more strategic arms control between the United States and Russia. It's because the Biden administration can't be trusted, because they have negotiated in bad faith, because they have sought to gain strategic advantage, um, and the Russians are just tired of the game. Uh, now, I would prefer the Russians don't take this hardline position. If I were advising Putin, I'd be advising a more moderate approach. But I understand if they say, we can't do that with Biden. We don't trust him. We can't trust him ever again. They lie to us. All they do is lie. And it's the truth. All America has done, all Europe has done, is lie to the Russians. So why would the Russians seek now to sit down at the table with people who have lied to them, whose strategic objective is the strategic defeat of Russia? Imagine for a second, if Russia said, you know, we're going to go to Mexico, and we're going to hold a coup d'etat, and we're going to turn it over into a pro-Russian government, that then we're going to encourage uh, this resurgence of Mexican nationalism, and we're going to work with them so they go across America's borders, work with the Hispanic American populations in the border states so that they rise up and we can strip those border states away from the United States. So California becomes Mexico again. 
Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, Colorado, all Mexico again. We're going to do this and we're going to try and create the conditions in Washington, D.C., where the American people rise up and overthrow the constitutional elected government. What do you think the United States would do? We would say, hell no. We would go to war to prevent that, rightfully so. So if any American heard what I just said and says, I would never allow that to happen, then why are you allowing us to do that against the Russians? Is that not a double standard? Because that's what we're doing in Ukraine. We're stripping Ukraine away from the Russian orbit. We're trying to use Ukraine as a mechanism for Russia to overthrow their government. It's a double standard, ladies and gentlemen, and it has to stop or else there will not be peace. Yeah, I think, um, and we'll we'll wrap it up. I appreciate your time so much. But uh, as I talk to people around the country, family, friends, uh, almost 100% of them have no idea that the United States uh, basically did a coup and established the government that they wanted in Ukraine. They they just don't know it. They don't teach it. They don't talk about it. And unless you get on podcasts and and do your own research, you don't know what you don't know. And so like even me, I, like up until a year ago, I didn't know any of this stuff and my eyes have have really been open. So I appreciate you using that analogy that we, we wouldn't allow Mexico uh, to do this to us. Why would Russia allow Ukraine backed by NATO and the United States to do this to Russia? Well, thank you. Uh, no, it, it, you're right. I mean, look, Thank you for having me on. Thank you for doing what you do, because this is the indirect approach. You know, we're, you're not going to get this information from mainstream media. Uh, it's only going to happen when, you know, people find alternative um, outlets to, to get this information out there. And I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to come on and, and talk with you about this. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if people want to correct me if I'm wrong, if people want to learn more or follow you, they can go to scottritterextra.com. And yeah, that's, that's uh, it. you you write on there regularly. It's well, it's a one stop shop, meaning I do a lot of podcasts. For instance, if you're kind enough to give me a link to your podcast, then I will link it in scottridderextra.com. Every podcast I do gets a link there. Anything I write, I write for a number of outlets. And so I put it there. There's no paywall. It's all accessible. Um, I have a uh, sub stack. Um, again, it's uh, accessible. You can read everything I write. If you want to donate, Thank you. That's how I'm able to have the time to do stuff like this. So I appreciate it. But if you if you can't or you're unable or you're unwilling, come on in, read it anyways. That's what it's there for. The, the idea is to provide an, uh, a, an outlet for people to gain access to information they might not otherwise have access to, not to dictate to you what to think or how to think, but to provide alternative information that can be considered as you form your own opinions. I always ask people, please, don't say, I believe something because Scott Ritter told me so. That's the worst thing in the world to say. What I prefer you to say is, I heard Scott Ritter say something. I thought he was full of horse manure. So I did the research. I ran the numbers and it turned out he was right. So I now I believe not what he said, but what I have learned or developed. Or if I challenge you something, you don't like it, and you find out and you disagree with me, at least that's an informed position. And you have to have an informed position to be a good American citizen, because only then can you carry out responsible debate, dialogue, and discussion that empowers us collectively to do the right thing. So I really appreciate you giving me an opportunity to come on here, and I I, I hope that this has been productive for your audience. Great. Thank you so much. Can they also get your new book, Disarmament of Perestroika? It's D Disarmament in the Time of Perestroika. It's a... Uh, it's a book about the implementation of the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty back in the 19, uh, late 1980s, 90s. I was a key player in that. So it's part memoir, but it's also a history of a time that nobody knows about. I will guarantee you that none of your audience knows anything that's in that book. And yet, and I, and I also say this somewhat tongue, tongue in cheek, but um, if you meet me, guys, shake my hand and buy me a beer because you wouldn't be alive today if it weren't for me the other Americans who did this treaty and their Soviet counterparts. Because if it weren't for the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, there would have been a nuclear war and we all would have died. That's how important this treaty is. And now people today take a look at the difficulty of U.S.-Russian relations and say, oh my God, how could we ever get out of this? I say, read my book. Because in the 1980s, it was just as bad or even worse. And because of this treaty, we broke down all the mistrust. We came together. We worked together in a cooperative fashion. We got rid of nuclear weapons, made the world a safer place. Uh, we squandered that opportunity, but we could do it again. So this book isn't just a history. It's a template of hope for the future, and I encourage people to read it. 
Okay, next okay. time you're on, I want to talk about this treaty. I want to talk about the BS around the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. And I also want to talk about the Afghanistan withdrawal. Scott Ritter, thank you so much for being on today's show. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.